Poets and Pancakes by Ashok Mitran. Ashok Mitran, a Tamil writer, recounts his years at Gemini Studios in his book, My Years with Bob, which talks about the influence of movies on every aspect of life in India. The Gemini Studios, located in Chennai, was set up in 1940. <coughs> It was one of the most influential film producing organizations of India in the early days of Indian filmmaking. Its founder was S. S. Vasan. The duty of Ashok Mitran in Gemini Studios was to cut out newspaper clippings on a wide variety of subjects and store them in files. Many of these had to be written out by hand. Although he performed an insignificant function, he was the most well informed of all the members of the Gemini family. The following is an excerpt from his book, My Ears with Bob. So it is actually an autobiography. And uh, many of the names which come in this chapter, they are the living ones, they are not fictitious. So here we start with the chapter, Poets and Pancakes. Pancake was the brand name of the makeup material that Gemini Studios bought in truckloads. Truckloads in in large amount. Get a Garbo must have used it. Miss Gohar must have used it. Vijayanti Vimala must also have used it. But Radni Abhinihotri may not have even heard of it. So generation of actresses, starting from Greta Garbo, who is considered to be one of the greatest actors, Hollywood actors of the silent era, and then Miss Gohar, Indian actress, Vijayanti Mala, a renowned actress and uh, uh, classical dancer and Rati Agnihotri, uh, many of you may not uh, know about her but one of the famous movies of 80s, Ek Duje Ke Liye, she was the lead uh, actress in that movie. So maybe in s to some generation, to, uh, till some generation of the film actors, this makeup material has been, may have been very popular. But gradually, it was replaced by other things. That is what the author wants to say. The makeup department of Gemini Studios was in the upstairs of a building that was believed to have been Robert Clive's tables. Robert Clive, you are all aware about. Uh, you are all aware uh, was one of the key figures in establishing the rule of East India Company in India. A dozen other buildings in the city are said to have been his residence for his brief life and even briefer stay in Madras. Robert Clive, seems, uh, Robert Clive seems to have done a lot of moving besides fighting some impossible battles in remote corners of India and marrying a maiden in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George in Madras. Now he describes the makeup room. The makeup room had the look of a haircutting salon with lights at all angles around half a dozen large mirrors. They were all incandescent lights, powerful lights. So he says that you can imagine the fiery misery of those subjected to makeup. So he says that you can just understand what sort of torture the artist must have gone through sitting under those bright lights which generated so much of heat uh, going through their makeup. The makeup department was first headed by a Bengali who became too big for a studio and left Mins. He became, he considered himself to be very important and finally he left the place. He was succeeded by a Maharashtrian who was assisted by a Dharwar Kanadiga, an Andhra, a Madras Indian, Madras Indian Christian, an Anglo-Burmese and the usual local Tamil. <coughs> so it was mixture of people from various parts of this country. All this shows that there was a great deal of national integration long before AIR, that is All India Radio and Doodrashan began broadcasting programs of national integration. So uh, Ashok Mitran feels that uh, Gemini Studios makeup department was the perfect example of national integration and long before, long before uh, All India Radio and Doodrashan uh, were broadcasting programs on national integration. This gang of nationally integrated makeup men could turn any decent looking person into hideous crimson huge monster with the help of truckloads of pancakes and a number of other locally made potions and lotions. <laughs> Look at the humor over here. Could turn any decent looking person into hideous crimson hued layers of makeup. And that's what he says, hideous. Uh, maybe 
uh, this whole thing was done because those were the days of mainly indoor shooting and only 5% of the film was shot outdoors. I suppose the sets and studio lights needed the girls and boys to be made to look ugly in order to look presentable in the mood. So if you look at the old movies, and especially some of the earlier color films, you will see that, you can easily see uh, if you uh, look at the screen, there were layer of makeup. Now these days, it is all natural makeup that the people are doing, but those were the days when layer of makeup was done so that they could look, they were, what does the author say, they were made ugly to look good or presentable in the movie because most of the shooting was done indoors. Only 5% of the film was shot outdoors. Most of the shooting was done under the lights in the studio. A strict hierarchy. What is hierarchy? Hierarchy is seniority uh, in any department, in anywhere, uh, it is first the uh, boss and then the subordinates and under them the other subordinates. The same sort of hierarchy was maintained in makeup department. The chief makeup man made the chief actors and actresses ugly, <laughs> so he is saying that it was the work of the chief makeup man to do the makeup of chief actor and actresses. He is senior assistant, the second hero and heroine, the junior assistant, the main comedian and so forth. The players who played the crowd were the responsibility of the office boy. Even the makeup department of Gemini Studio had an office boy. On the days when there was crowd shooting, you could see him mixing his paint in a giant vessel and slapping it on the crowd players. Now you can you just, just try to visualize this scene. The crowd shooting and the extras who were the part of the crowd standing in the line and this office boy who has prepared the lotion and potion in a big drum and with a paint brush, most probably uh, a brush like which is used for the painting of the walls in the house, dipping that brush, calling them one by one and slapping that layer of makeup on their faces and every uncovered part of the body. The idea was to close every pore on the surface of the face in process of applying makeup. He wasn't exactly a boy. He was in his early 40s, having entered the studios years ago in the hope of becoming a star actor or a top screen writer, director or lyrics writer. He was a bit of a poet. So he had joined the film industry with very high aspirations, but then eventually he turned out only to be office, uh, an office boy whose work was to assist in doing the makeup of the extras or the crowd. In those days, he said, I worked in a cubicle, two whole sides of which were French windows. I didn't know at that time that they were called French windows. Seeing me sitting at my desk, staring at newspapers day in and day out, most people thought I was doing next to nothing. So that was his work. Uh, he had to collect the newspaper articles related to the Gemini Studios or the review of the films produced by the Gemini Studios or other films or everything. So that was his work and everyone thought that he was the most useless person in that studio. It is likely that the boss thought like was too. So anyone who felt I should be given some occupation would barge, would rush into his cubicle and deliver an extended lecture. The boy in the makeup department had decided I should be enlightened on how great literary talent was being allowed to go west in a department fit only for barbers and perverts. Now this office boy, he seems to be a frustrated person. He had come there with a high aspiration of becoming a, an actor or a director or a lyricist or something like that. But he turned out to be only an office boy. And he felt that his, his talent, he felt that he was extremely talented and his talent was getting wasted in a department of barbers and perverts, mentally deranged people. And every time whenever he was free, he would come there and start talking about himself to the author. And author was very soon bored and soon he was praying for crowd shooting all the time. Nothing sort of it could save me from his effects. <coughs> Now, author says that in all instances of frustration, someone who is not successful, the anger is always directed to a single person. The person who is not successful points to that person 
blaming that person that that person is responsible for his failure or something like that. Now, this boy, his entire ignominy, his entire woes, ignominy and neglect he felt was due to Kot Mangalam. Subhu was the number two at Germany Studios, very important person. He couldn't have had a more encouraging opening in films than our grown-up makeup boy had. On the contrary, he must have had to face more uncertain and difficult times. For when he began his career, career there were no formally established film producing companies or studios. <coughs> so, author feels that uh, when Subhu joined studios or when Subhu joined the filmmaking, uh, maybe he had more difficult time than this office boy. Even in the matter of education, especially formal education, Subhu couldn't have had an appreciable lead over our boy. But by virtue of being born a Brahmin, a virtue indeed, he must have had exposure to some more in affluent situations and people. So he feels that maybe because he was Brahmin by caste, and so he was, uh, he had more reach to affluent people. He had ability to look cheerful at all times. Now here he is talking entirely about Subhu. He had the ability to look cheerful at all times, even after having had a hand in a flop film. He always had work for somebody. He could never do things on his own. But his sense of loyalty made him identify himself with his principle completely and turn his entire creativity to his principle's advantage. He was boss's man. He was tailor made for films. He was a man who could be inspired when commanded. The rat fights the tigress underwater and kills her, but takes pity on the cubs and tends them lovingly. I don't know how to do the scene, the producer would say. The producer would give the situation to Subhu, and Subhu would come out with four ways of the rat pouring affection on its victim's offspring. And then the producer would say that maybe, maybe, I'm not sure if it is effective enough. And in a minute, Subhu would come out with 14 more alternatives. So he, he was tailor-made for films. He was tailor-made for films. Filmmaking must have been and was so easy with a man like Subhu around. And if ever there was a man who gave direction and definition to Gemini Studios during its golden years, it was Subhu. So Subhu was very much instrumental in the uh, rise of Gemini Studio. Apart from filmmaking, Subhu had other talents also. Subhu had a separate identity as a poet. And though he was certainly capable of more complex and higher forms, he deliberately chose to address his poetry to the masses. His success in films overshadowed and dwarfed his literary achievements. Or so his critics felt. His critics felt that if he could have paid more attention to his literary talent, maybe he would have been more renowned as a literary person and as an author, as a poet. But his filmmaking achievement was very big and that actually dwarfed, that actually surpassed, suppressed his literary talent. He composed several truly original story poems in folk reference and diction and also wrote a sprawling novel, Tilana Mohanambal, with dozens of very deftly etched characters. Now, uh, uh, Mangalam Subhu, he also got uh, Padma Bhushan or Padma Bhushan. He quite successfully recreated the mood and manner of the Devdasis of the early 20th century. He was, apart from uh, filmmaking, apart from being a poet, apart from being a writer, he was an amazing actor, though he never aspired to the lead role. But whatever subsidiary role he played in <coughs> any of the films, he performed better than the supposed main player. Now he had a genuine love for anyone he came across and his house was a permanent residence for dozens of near and far relations and acquaintances. So he was a very charitable person. It seemed against Subhu's nature to be even conscious that he was feeding and supporting so many of them, though he was sheltering so many of them. But still, he hardly ever thought about it. He hardly ever thought about it. 
he even did not mind that he was feeding so many people. Such a charitable and improvident man, and yet he had enemies. But then, this man had also enemies. Was it because he seemed so close and intimate with the boss? Or was it his general demon that resembled a psychopath, psychopath, that is, chamcha, as we say it in our local language? Or his readiness to say nice things about everything? In any case, there was this man in the makeup department who would wish the direst things for Subhu, who was totally against Subhu. Though Subhu was always with the boss, but in the attendance role, he was grouped under a department called the story department. Now, this story department was uh, comprising a lawyer and assembly of writers and poets. The lawyer was also officially known as the legal advisor, but everybody referred to him as the opposite, that is, illegal advisor. Now, what was the reason behind it? Because it so happened that an extremely talented actress, who was also extremely temperamental, once blew over on the set. Well, everyone stood stunned. Everyone was shocked. Now, this lawyer, he quietly switched on the recording equipment. And when the actress paused for breathe, the lawyer said to her, one minute please, and played back the recording. He recorded everything what the actress said in her anger. There was nothing incriminating or unmentionably foul about actresses tirade against the producer. There was nothing like that. It was just the anger. But when she heard her voice again, through the sound equipment. She was shocked. She was shocked. She was a girl from the countryside. Ah, and she was very raw, you can say, that she has not yet learned the ways of the world. And she hadn't gone through all the stages of worldly experience that generally precedes a position of importance and sophistication that she had found herself catapulted to. She may have become successful in some of the movies, but she, has, she had not yet learned the ways of the world. And she was completely shocked. She never quite recovered from the terror she felt that day. That was the end of a brief and brilliant acting career. The legal advisor, who was also the member of the story department, had unwittingly brought about that sand. And there was, there was no intention, but that act of him brought an end of the career, brilliant career, brilliant acting career, because that actress could never get out of the shock that she received that day. Uh, now, every member of the department wore a kind of uniform. Khadi dhoti with a slightly oversized and clumsily tailored white khadi shirt. But the legal advisor, he was totally different. He wore pants and tie and sometimes a coat that looked like a coat of mail. Coat of mail means totally decorated ones and all that. He looked alone and helpless. He was odd man out in that department. A man of cold logic and crowd of dreamers. A neutral man in an assembly of Gandhiites and Khadiites. Like so many of those who were close to the boss, he was allowed to produce a film. And though a lot of raw stock and pancake were used on it, not much came of the film. And then one day, the boss closed down the story department. Maybe something must have happened and boss would have thought that it was not uh, giving any results or something like that. So he decided to close the story department. And author said that this was perhaps the only instance in all the human history where a lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home. The story department was closed. The writers and poets were asked to go home. And as the department was closed, and lawyer was a part of that department, he lost his job. And that's why author says, perhaps the only instance in all instance, only example in all human history, where a lawyer lost his job because the poets were asked to go home. Gemini Studios was the favorite haunt of poets like S.D.S. Yogiyar, Sangu Subramaniam, Krishna Shastri, and Haridana Chattopadhyay. Now, these are the very famous names. Some of them are actors, some of them are poets and literary figures. It had an excellent mess, which supplied good coffee at all times of the day and for most part of the night. Those were the days when Congress rule meant prohibition. Prohibition means that time, uh, just after the independence. Uh, there were many states in India where the Congress ruled, and following the uh, ethics of Gandhiji, uh, there was a prohibition. Now, whenever you see this prohibition written in capital, it means that ban on or prohibition on 
sale and purchase and consumption of liquor. So, it was prohibition time and meeting over a cup of coffee was rather satisfying entertainment. Barring the office boys and a couple of clerks, everybody else at studios radiated leisure, a prerequisite for poetry. Most of them wore Khadi and worshipped Gandhiji, but beyond that they had not the faintest appreciation for political thought of any kind. Naturally, they were all averse to term communism. They all hated communism. According to them, a communist was a godless man. He had no filial or conjugal love. He had no compunction about killing his own parents or his children. He was always out to cause and spread unrest and violence among innocent and ignorant people. Such notion, which prevailed everywhere else in South India at that time also, naturally floated about vaguely among the khadi clad poets of Gemini Studios. Evidence of it was soon forthcoming. So in entire South India, this was the common feeling about the communism and the communists. They were considered to be troublemakers. They were considered to someone who had no hesitation in killing their own parents and children. And they were considered to be someone who were always out to cause and spread unrest and violence among innocent and ignorant people. And this was the common thought. And this was also the belief of the poets of Gemini Studios. And very soon there were certain examples which were going to happen which proved this particular thing.